Hello and welcome everyone to the Institute for Government. My name is Hannah White and I'm Director of the IFG. I'm delighted that today we are holding this In Conversation event with Alex Chisholm, Chief Operating Officer for the Civil Service and Permanent Secretary of the Cabinet Office, who of course is stepping down from those roles in a few weeks. Thank you to everyone who's joined us here in the room for this event and for those of us, those of you who are joining online. I'll be putting plenty of questions to Alex, but then there'll be an opportunity for you to ask your questions. If you're here in the room, we'll do that uh, with a microphone. Uh, if you're joining online, please do send in your questions via Slido, um, and I will be taking some of those questions via my iPad. Um, we'll also be live tweeting from IFG events using the hashtag, hashtag civil service, so please do follow and tweet along. So before we begin, um, a little introduction to Alex. He's, uh, as you will all no doubt know, been COO of the Civil Service and PermSec of the Cabinet Office since April 2020, almost four years, and a fairly eventful four years at that uh, for the Civil Service. He was per previously Permanent Secretary of the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and the Department for Energy and Climate Change and before that, Chief Executive of the Competition and Markets Authority. He started his career as an official, but then also worked in the private sector before returning to the civil service. And in his current role has driven several areas of civil service reform, championing the relocation of officials outside of London, as well as embedding the functional agenda, something we care about a lot here at the IFG, and improving digital and data skills in the civil service. And in November, he announced he'd be stepping down at the end of his term next month, uh, so we're delighted to have the opportunity to talk to him today. Welcome, Alex. So, um, first of all, it would just be really interesting to hear your reflections on four years in these really crucial roles for the civil service. Great, thanks, Hannah, and uh, afternoon, everybody. And uh, really appreciate the IFG hosting this event. And indeed, uh, with the week we've had also a massive report earlier in the week, um, really good to get your external view about what we could be doing differently and better. And we'll perhaps come on to that later. But just reflecting, as you, um, as you say, on the four years, um, you mentioned I started April 20. And of course, that was uh, the beginning of lockdown. So to starting at the uh, cabinet office uh, um, at that time was, was remarkable and bizarre, I must say. Um, and, and I think when we look back on this era, um, quite aside from all the other things that have been happening, the three dominant things will be undoubtedly um, Brexit, uh, the COVID response, and war in Europe. Um, and uh, obviously, all of those have their own kind of ongoing ramifications. But um, I particularly wanted maybe just to call out on, on, on COVID, because I think that quite a lot of the media environment of late has been quite critical. Um, obviously, that's some of the tone coming from the uh, independent legal inquiry. Um, and having sort of uh, lived the dream, uh, uh, I think what hasn't been recognized enough is that uh, civil servants, not only in my own department, but right across government and public servants did extraordinary things in response to COVID to help um, save people's lives and livelihoods. And if those things hadn't been done, we'd have been much worse off. And I think there hasn't been perhaps quite enough recognition and appreciation for that. And as I said, you're, uh, you have a success now, Catlift mm -hmm. has been uh, announced. What would your advice be uh, to her after your, having had four years in the role. And I guess, you know, what do you wish you knew when you, when you began the role? Um, I was actually um, with, with a group of colleagues last night um, marking my departure. And one of them said the advice I gave to her when she joined number 10 um, was that what was needed was relentless optimism. So <laughs> I was quite um, pleased to be reminded of that because I do think that is a good quality to bring both um, the optimism, because we all believe in a better world, we need to take the chance we have in government to try and bring that about. But also um, the relentlessness, because um, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Uh, sometimes it is three steps forward and two steps back, occasionally the other way around. I've had days like that too. Um, you need to stick at it. Um, you need to remember that it's a big and powerful and complicated system, so bringing about change within it is not easy, but it is very worthwhile. And that when you can achieve that collaboration, you can line up people's incentives, you can get people to see that's the, where we're moving towards and move in that direction. It's also much, immensely powerful and makes a huge difference to everybody across the whole country. So very worthwhile. Within that, the things that I think that are most important um, uh, it, from a value perspective, first of all, 
um, around the making sure that we remain in touch with communities across the whole country and don't fall into any aspect of kind of whitehallism. You know, uh, we're in London today, but the civil service is mainly not in London, and we've made great progress, I think, in the last four years through the Place of Growth program in transferring roles across the whole of the UK, creating 15 vibrant hubs in places where there used not to be many civil servants, uh, towns like, um, or cities like Wolverhampton, Darlington, um, places like Glasgow where there were a lot of civil servants. We had just two there when I started, um, and uh, Michael Gove was our chancellor. The Dutch Lancaster then challenged us to set up a second headquarters in Glasgow. We now have 560. Um, and a very different group of people we have there bringing a very different perspective from different backgrounds, really strongly embedded in their communities as well. I think that is a very important dimension, so we want to carry on with that, take it further still. Secondly, I would pick out uh, digital and data. Um, that's the kind of the uh, the most important area of change, both in wider, wider society, we know that in all of our uh, personal lives and business lives, as well as in government, but also in government, it's got the best prospect for transforming people's experience of services, um, the cost of delivering those services, the timeliness, the ability to customize that, all of that is, is there in the capability of the technology and, and uh, um, the systems we use and the data breakthroughs that have been achieved. We now need to get very good at using that in government, and if we do, we'll do an amazing job for citizens, and they will be surprised on the upside by what they're getting from government. Great. Um, so those are things you would urge CAT to, to press on with, essentially? Yes. OK. Um, Probably also just one, you know, maybe two other things now you mentioned it. The um, partnership with the political system, I think, is really important. When we set out on the kind of reform journey in 2020, that was one of the things we looked in the past and seen what, what can go wrong is either when it seems to be a political initiative which the civil service is a bit kind of like mm, a little tiny bit half-hearted about or uh, when the civil service is doing it for itself and the politicians are like, hang on, we're in charge here, you know, we control resources and everything like that and we set the priorities. So it has to be in lockstep in that, in that real kind of um, partnership mode. Which is going to um, be easier if you have consistency of political leadership. <laughs> A fair observation. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupt. Second point. Um, and the other thing I think is that um, it does play a little bit to what I was saying about being able to operate across the whole UK. That you know we mustn't be sort of um, a small group of people at the centre trying to determine what's the best thing to do. I mean that is the kind of um, you know the failure type within government from lots of different programmes and things in the past. Um, so it's very important that we listen to what people across the whole of the civil service are saying, listen to what the users of public service are saying, and adapt ourselves to that. So we don't want to be too cabinet office or uh, treasury or number 10 about it. We need to make sure that we really make sure that it's, um, uh, it reflects the real needs um, and priorities and can be delivered across the whole of the country. What does that look like in practice, that listening? Like how, what have you seen that's successful that you would like to see? that well, would make a step change in that? Yeah, so um, just give a few examples of that. So um, I remember um, being in Darlington um, and you know, also for a whole series of visits, but one of the other sort of events that were happening that day was the, the Treasury Labour Markets team, a uh, young group of brilliant people who had come to Darlington for the day, although a couple of them I think were located there, were meeting with people working in the local benefits office um, not just civil servants there, but also people who were themselves going through work coaching. And they were having a workshop based on that about to try and understand better what it was that would induce people to come into the, uh, back into full-time work. That type of working is very different from sitting in one's office in Vital and saying, I think I know best and you know, reading research. So it's much more community-based and much more kind of working across the discipline. So I think that is a great example of it. Um, We've also, um, the civil service is a pretty vary, varied group of people. Um, you know, uh, the difference between people working on policy of ministers or legislation and people working in, um, in border force or in benefits office, again, a huge difference. So um, when we were doing the second phase of our reform, uh, Sapna and myself, calling out Sapna Agrawal in the audience here, um, uh, did a kind of a road show. We travelled up and down the country and, and uh, with the help of other uh, colleagues as well, listened to... Um, the views of people at all different um, uh, professions, functions, departments, grades, and that really helped us sort of see what, what matters to them. Um, and some of those things were actually quite practical. I remember 
uh, you know, working in the cabinet office with some, you know, digital experts and, uh, you know, uh, AI experts, etc. You know, I'm obviously very excited about that. But, you know, it was, it was sobering to find that in many of the big delivery departments, the big game changer had been having their own laptop, which they'd acquired because of lockdown. But actually, in comparison to the performance they were able to get from their work, that made a huge difference. Mm. And being able to access systems remotely, um, again, was hugely important for those departments. So, it, you know, it's just another example. One shouldn't get too carried away with, you like, the, uh, the sort of cutting edge and the, you know, the frontier possibilities. And just remember that the reality is good quality basic systems um, and facilities people are working in and the, sk and the training for them is, is, is incredibly important. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, some of our work in public services, which has mm. found that a step change could be created in the NHS by better use of the technology, which is the telephone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rather than anything more complicated. Exactly, and then when we're talking about you know, shared services across government and interoperability, which is again one of our big uh, you know, agenda items for change, um, people used to complain about the Wi-Fi. I've noticed that it's the absence of complaint is sometimes the sign that you've made progress, and that's, you know, 250,000 people a day are using Gov Wi-Fi across 274 locations. It seems to work pretty well. That's why the, the, the silence of, uh, <laughs> of contentment. <laughs> Something you have to yep. chalk up as a win, absolutely. Um, you kindly mentioned our report we yep. published uh, at the start of the week. Um, uh, you will have noticed, uh, indeed, you're very helpful in, in helping us develop our, our thinking. It was pretty critical in the end about mm. the Cabinet Office, and I was reflecting um, on the evidence you gave to PACAC, in mm -hmm. which you said that you felt that uh, there were benefits mm -hmm. to the two parts of the Cabinet Office, essentially, mm -hmm. that, that sit together, the Secretariat and mm. the fun more functional side. Uh, but also some costs. Mm -hmm. um, just really interested in your reaction to the report as a whole, but in particular, obviously, the, the critique of our conclusion was that you ought to split up the Cabinet Office, take that functional uh, side of it into a separate department yeah. where there could be a really strong focus on civil service reform and driving that, yeah. and combine the secretariats with number 10. Yeah. Interested in your thoughts. Great, yeah. So um, uh, obviously it won't be for me to, to decide. Ministers will decide and it won't be for me to implement either because I'll be finished unless it happens in the next three weeks, which I think is unlikely. Um, um, you can always but hope. The, um, <clears throat> a few things. First of all, it, it's great to have your report. I know you did a really um, deep study on that. Lots of excellent research analysis there. Lots of consultation. Really, really good. Um, also wanted to call out you know, some other good reports we've had as well from, you know, from Reform, from uh, Francis Maud recently. Uh, lots. So... That is great. So good public reports, well evidenced and researched, um, really adds to the, to the quality of public debate and will enable whatever choices to be made to be well informed and hopefully for the better. Um, second point I make is that um, quite a lot of what people want is actually changes in behaviour and priority and culture and you don't tend to achieve those just by structural change and you know, moving things around and they, um, the capabilities of the people they work on and what they're asked to work on, the facilities they have, are arguably more important than the institutional or organisational wrapper they, they work within. Um, and moving things around is surprisingly expensive. Uh, you've written some great reports, one I think, uh, just a couple of years ago, about you know, tens of millions of pounds in direct costs, we've changed to systems, etc., lining up policies um, for HR and what have you, but actually much bigger costs in terms of the kind of the impact on disruption, engagement, people's sense of identity, their worry about where they fit within the new organisation, the, the reputation of the organisation, all of that. So be careful what you wish for. I think that, you know, make sure that if you're making a change, you're really sure uh, it's well thought through, it's going to be changed for the better, and you've got a very clear theory about why it would be better. Just moving it around or pushing it out of sight doesn't particularly help. Um, cabinet office uh, itself has got bigger, but one of the reasons it's got bigger is because lots of functions that used to be done elsewhere have been moved into the cabinet office. Uh, not everybody may know that Fastream is an HR used to be managed by HMRC. Uh, property and uh, commercial was part of the treasury. Those things got moved into the cabinet office in previous years. Security vetting from MOD and uh, from the foreign office, etc. So we've become a kind of a repository for things. And that has a benefit, I would say, in terms of uh, doing things once well rather than many times over. That's a clear efficiency. Doesn't mean it has to be done in the cabinet office. Um, 
and, and not all of that has to be done at the center. So on the whole, I think you want to have quite a light center that therefore is easy to operate in as a group of people who have a, a degree of mutual understanding and um, familiarity. Also one which is primarily strategic and calling other people to account rather than delivering a lot of services itself. Um, and then the other thing I point I make is that if you compare the UK with other democratic countries, um, almost everyone's got a, a group of people around the top person, prime minister, president, whatever it might be called, um, in some kind of a kind of department we call ours number 10. We're a bit unusual compared to some countries in having this apparatus of cabinet, but it's a, it's a UK feature. We like that, we want to support that. Almost, you know, all the better countries now, so more developed countries, would have crisis management capability at the center. Um, and I, you know, I think that is good. I, 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 you know, I wouldn't want it any other way. And uh, as, as you know very well, Hannah, you know, crises, they, they, they do come thick and fast. <laughs> and uh, ha having good capability to both to anticipate those, to try and head them off and then deal with it when it comes upon you is pretty essential. So the more arguable point is probably around the sort of corporate functions. Um, obvious benefits in combining it together in terms of political alignment. Um, You've said in your report it might be better off in a separate department, um, especially if you integrate that more closely with public expenditure, as happens in many other countries. So there are some clear choices there, but I'd be very keen that whoever makes those choices thinks it through very, very carefully and also um, involves staff very much in that, so that staff say, oh, yes, at last, not, oh, no, not again. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Well, I, I mean, as you imply, we at the IFG are normally the last people to advocate mm. for machinery of government change. And I think one of the things we often observe is that um, because the civil service is very good at sort of smoothing over the pain mm -hmm. of machinery of government change from the point of view of ministers, ministers don't often perceive the costs which do, <laughs> which are incurred. Yeah. Um, they say, no, no, it's fine when we did whichever change it was when actually the civil servants uh, have, have been uh, experiencing more of the pain. <laughs> um, yeah. So we, we, we would be the, the last to recommend it. I think what we were really struck by uh, in a year of taking evidence from a whole range of different people was the uh, consistency of the message mm -hmm. that the current structures aren't working. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we were convinced that mm -hmm. there was a, a need for change. And part of it is what you were saying exactly about the sense of identity. Yes, there's a sense of identity that might be lost if you mm -hmm. made the change. But at the moment, a clear message was it's just really hard for the Cabinet Office to have that clear sense of identity yeah. for the very yeah. reasons that yeah. you say of having yeah. so many different things yeah. brought in. I think the other thing is that you know, what are the, the sort of enduring permanent capabilities, I would say, crisis response and the, the secretariat function in support of Cabinet government, and what are the temporary ones? And you know, if you look over the last uh, four, you know, if the IFG had written a report like this five years ago, I, you know, or, uh, seven years ago, it wouldn't have said um, that, that the Cabinet Office needed to have a huge level of capability in European matters, but we ended up absorbing uh, the Department for exiting the EU as well as the former Europe unit. Um, it certainly wouldn't have said you need to have 380 people working the COVID task force because what's this COVID thing? You didn't have a permanent public pandemic response, certainly not in the Cabinet Office. So, um, you know, uh, a high level of contingency and ability yeah. at the centre to move your resource, or, your resource around and switch into things that the situation requires, plus the kind of changes that are brought about by in a more uh, purposeful way, such as obviously David Cameron intended, you know, to say, I want the National Security Council to be operating as a structure in support of that, the NSS. Um, you know, also post Chilcot, uh, it was a key recommendation there to have a substantial, well-resourced uh, joint intelligence organization operating independently from NSS. So those two have, have uh, had lasting impacts on the shape and functions of the Cabinet Office. I fear I could talk about our report for the rest of the event, so I'm not going to. Um, can we turn to the Civil Service People Survey? Go for it. Um, we're really pleased to see the results of that published more quickly, mm -hmm. as you um, agreed to do. Again, yep. that was in response to Maybe I'm going to do it anyway, but something that PACAC had recommended. Yep. Um, but it, it did show overall officials' engagement and attachment to the civil service as an organisation falling for the third year in a row, which feels like it's becoming a trend. How can that be turned around? I mean, if you go back to when the people surveys start, it's kind of like, you know, everything's gone up massively. And then, you know, we hit a peak 
uh, actually in the COVID year, um, and then have fallen back two years since I met. So, um, but only by one percentage point in each of those things. The things that get measured there um, are particularly around your um, you know, organizational loyalty and commitment to want to stay there. Those are the key things driving the engagement index. Um, we've had a lot of movement. Um, uh, cabin office, for example, I think four and a half uh, years is the average um, term for a cabinet officer uh, official. So huge amount of change there. So uh, right across government, that would be replicated. Um, so that probably affects those figures a bit. Um, two things that trouble me most um, would be the scores in relation to pay and benefits and the scores in relation to leadership and, and managing change. Um, the first of those uh, fell pretty uh, catastrophically in 22. They've recovered a fair bit in 23, uh, but they still don't show, I would say, a strong picture. Um, and I, you know, I really worry about going back to the well of people's commitment and the you know, obvious fabulous interest and value of public service, um, but I do think that pay has become a really serious issue. Um, and the NEO uh, report you saw published showed that every, um, every grade bar one, I think the, the most uh, junior grade AA, um, uh, all of the other grades over the last 10 years, the median wage has gone down in real terms and quite, quite considerably in many cases. So that's a real problem issue and the people survey is, is saying that's an issue, pay attention to it, uh, oh leadership. So that's, that's one. I think the other thing is that leadership and managing change, which is much more in our own power. Um, it turns out, not surprising, that, that people have a certain capacity for change. Um, and the absorption rate was, I think, uh, exceeded in many cases in, uh, in, in uh, 22. 23 has shown a good recovery there. Um, I hope you noticed the cabinet office was the top performing department and was up on all scores. I <laughs> uh, have to use that uh, opportunity to say so. But we put a big effort into that. But a lot of that was about engaging with people working in the cabinet office, about the purpose of their work, how we were organized for it, involving them in the change process. And people said they did feel very well. You know, the, the, the quality of the communication leadership was much improved and much more visible, and they really appreciated that. OK. Are you worried by the drop off in civil service fast stream applications, 45% across all schemes over the last three years? Um, the, there were a couple of factors that came into that. Um, uh, I think it was three years ago now when we actually paused the fast stream momentarily, so that would have affected the application rates that year um, due to a political decision made at that time. Um, secondly, we have been quite deliberately trying to adjust the balance of the fast stream towards more of a STEM subjects thing. The, um, and everybody comes to the fast stream now goes into a, a more specialized field. So we're kind of moving away from generalized, uh, doesn't matter what your background is, and a bit more focused on the skills that you bring to it, and also then having slightly more specialized careers. That may be impacting the overall numbers. I haven't seen any signs at all that it's affecting the quality. Um, and indeed, uh, you know, it would be common observation of people in my generation, I joined the first stream a very long time ago, many decades ago, that the quality of people is even higher. It's really hard to get into, and I wouldn't like to apply now. So, um, you know, it is a great scheme. It's a really popular scheme. It's regularly assessed as being, you know, it's either number one or number two graduate scheme in the country. They've also become, I think, much better at inviting people from lots of different backgrounds, different communities across the country. Um, it's a great scheme, and I don't have worries about that, actually, no. You're not worried? No. Um, the, the only, the only other issue is how many people realistically um, are going to have accel accelerated promotion to the top level of senior management. And there are some issues there, I think, about how big the SCS is, how big it's gone, and also the balance between internal promotions and external ones. But the fast stream scheme itself, I think, is in pretty good shape. I mean, just because you mentioned the, the science um, focus, mm. the drop-off in that area of applications has been 78% over three years. So, It's a very competitive market, but we, our aim was to try and get over 50% of the people who um, accepted offers from STEM backgrounds, and we, I think we had about 60% in the first year we did that, and we're still over 50% this year, yeah. I mean, do you think pay is yeah. an issue there as well? I'm imagining that pay is an issue there as well, <laughs> yes. We have actually taken big steps to improve our stream pay, and I think that will help, because we were concerned that there hadn't been a, uh, an increase for, I think it's about like eight years. Um, 
So we had a big process of ministers and they agreed to do that. We made big changes. Actually, it's a, I think it's a three-year change program, so that pay will be going up progressively. Uh, we've got two more years of that. Uh, for people working here in London, recognizing the huge cost that people have in London, um, we also now do pay a London waiting, so I think that will help as well. Um, the other aspect is just the speed of offer, because um, I think the data shows that people with STEM backgrounds are more likely to have more counter offers, um, which speaks to their immediate employability, not necessarily their long-term employability, um, and, and therefore being able to quickly turn um, you know, uh, someone's application into a straight offer, the, your, your, your time to market there makes a big difference. Yeah. As I recall, the process was quite long for the first stream back in the it's, day. It's I'm very sure thorough. it's much better now. <laughs> um, finally, just a question for me about overall staff numbers yep. in the civil service. Uh, the latest numbers have uh, full-time equivalents of over half a million for the first time mm -hmm. since 2007. Yep. Um, the immediate cap on numbers yeah, yeah. Uh, that was announced in October, yeah. how, do, how do those two things compute? Um, I think the most important thing really is the cost and the sustainability of that. Um, and that also we shouldn't only look at civil servants, we should look at public servants. So around about half a million civil servants, around about five million public servants. Those are actually quite fungible. You know, there are jobs that can be done uh, by civil servants, the Ministry of Defence and, and by armed forces. Uh, more expensive to be done by armed forces, but you can move those numbers around. That's true for, other, for all other departments as well. Plus, cost gets you thinking about, do you want this being done by civil servants at all, or would you prefer it to be done by consultants or contractors or um, other partners that you might have in civil society? So I think cost is your best guide to what you're trying to achieve. Um, my view with that is that, of course, we should expect civil service numbers to fall because, like any other organisation, we're living through a, a kind of a, a di the digital revolution and everybody should be able to use um, uh, technology and data to be able to do the tasks they formerly had much more easily at lower cost and with um, uh, higher levels of uh, reliability. So that's, that's the underlying reality and I, you know, uh, that is improving things at this rate. Obviously, demand is also growing. People's um, population is growing. The number of people in need of public services, their expectations, the quality of public services are going up. So it's a race between those two things. Uh, because I am relentlessly optimistic, <laughs> um, Fortunately. Uh, I think that the uh, productivity and innovation will, um, will, will, will win out against the increasing demand and expectations. And with that, it will mean that people working in the civil service everybody's job is going to become more valuable because they, the literal the output of their work would be greater. It doesn't matter whether you're working in customer services or case management or any other function you could have or policy development. Anyone, anyone working in government should expect to be much more productive as a result of this technological revolution over the next few years. And that, I think, with the right investments, obviously, in digital infrastructure and training and everything else that goes with that, will enable the the overall service quality to rise without the cost rise, rising, and that will also improve the capability to pay people a more competitive wage. That's my optimistic view of how that will play out. As you, as you keep saying this, I keep hearing the voice of the PAC echoing my, in my head about civil service optimism bias. Um, I want to move straight from that into one of the questions we've had online. We're going to come to questions, so everybody in the room, please have your questions ready, but it flows quite nicely in from what you're saying into just ask you to be perhaps a little bit more specific. Where do you see AI and advanced technologies improving public services, both in back office efficiencies, but also in terms of the public good on the front line? Can you be a bit more specific about what you, where you see, see the biggest changes happening? Yeah, very happily. So, I mean, the most, most important thing I get is in the more, uh, if you like, routine type operations where you've got um, several tens of thousands of people doing basic administrative tasks where a big part of the, uh, the daily uh, task is to put together information to present a picture about a particular case. It could be health related, it could be education related, it could be um, uh, immigration related, lots of different types of cases we do. Um, it could be businesses as well, people getting grants and so on like that. So all of that is case based. Um, assembling that information and coming up with a first a first up scoring of that information against preset criteria. Um, I envisage that in time being better done by um, AI enhanced machines. Um, that won't take 
the people out of it because the people will then be involved in trying to make assessments on that, trying to make judgments on that, trying to manage the human interactions when they deliver those, those uh, um, results to members of the public who are affected. Um, but it will mean that the, the task of trying to get data together um, and to do an initial assessment will be uh, made much easier for them by the power of the system they're working with. That's also going to be true of people in customer-facing roles where <coughs> enormous numbers of people, I think around about um, a million requests a year come into HMRC telephone lines asking for their NINO. Does everyone know what a NINO is, your national insurance number? Is that a good use of waiting on, online to get through to that number to ask something, a piece of data which you could have had been able to look up? Um, and um, uh, a third of the calls that come into the student loans company are, what's the status of my application? Could we perhaps, you know, find a better way of dealing with that? And, you know, so I just, you know, I use these as examples. It's not great to be sitting there in HMRC answering the call saying your national insurance number is. That's not a particularly high value job. And it's not great to be waiting online to get through to that person to get that piece of information. So huge improvements, I think, in the quality of those you know, th these are not cutting edge things at all, but just, just being able to introduce technology available now, make it available to people um, across the civil service is going to bring big gains in productivity and job quality as well. Great. Okay, we'll get to some questions from the audience now. If you're in the room, we will have a microphone roving. Please do wait for the microphone to reach you before you begin your question. Do say who you are and what organisation you're from, and we'll try and take questions in groups if that's okay. No problem you, at all. Alex. Um, Stian. Thank you, and thank you for that, Alex. That was fascinating. Um, Stian Westlake from the Economic and Social Research Council. I wanted to ask about missions. Um, obviously, when you ran Bayes, you delivered a very successful industrial strategy focused around four grand challenges. Um, at the moment, the PM has his five pledges to kind of bring together government. Um, whoever, uh, after the election, if the opposition is successful, we may have a set of five missions that Labour are talking about at the moment. What I'd just like to hear about from your perspective at the centre of the civil service, how can missions bring officials together across government? How have you found, have you found that as a tool to help galvanise the civil service? Okay. Thanks. There's a gentleman on the aisle just here. Uh, Gus Tugendhat, the founder of Tussle. Um, I was wondering what you think the procurement-related challenges are awaiting an incoming government. Thank you. And the gentleman here at front. Hi, I'm uh, Matthew Trimming, Senior Advisor at uh, Public. I had the privilege of uh, working on uh, Sir Alex's uh, modernisation and reform work back in 2020 mm -hmm. uh, when we did some work on innovation for you. Um, I was struck by how closely you and Kat have worked mm -hmm. um, over the years. And I think that is uh, a very good piece of innovation, which hopefully will be continued. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the role of, or maybe even the greater role of evaluation. I know that was a theme alongside innovation that you both spoke about at uh, the uh, December PAC. Great. Happy to take those three questions. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, so, Stian, a um, uh, great question about missions. Um, uh, I think that they, it probably speaks to two sort of fundamental things. One is that um, as a narrative in politics, I think a sense of mission uh, has been shown to be uh, uh, a winning narrative in many cases. So lots of different languages used around that, but some kind of mission thing is there. Try and say, what is it that if you elect me that you will get as a consequence that seems desirable? Um, missions are good. I think the second thing is that although we're organised quite vertically still with our government departments, the reality is that all the important stuff is now cross-cutting and um, you kind enough to mention the industrial strategy, you could say the same about net zero, about levelling up and also about big social problems. You've got to deal with something like homelessness or recidivism, you know, that's going to be a joined up effort between you know, Home Office, DWP, uh, Department for uh, Health and Social Care, uh, MOJ, etc. So, um, I think uh, whatever administration we get next, they're likely to be you know, putting an emphasis on that, as we have been in the last administrations. Um, what are the challenges that come with that? I think that um, people actually quite like working in the civil service in the, that type of way. I think you know, that, that's, that's quite motivational. It's, it, um, so I don't think there's issues there. Um, the kind of old-fashioned idea of warring baronies, I don't really recognize that picture, so I don't think that's an issue. I think where there are difficulties are 
sometimes in aligning up resources against those missions because resources are basically vertically done through the accounting officer structure and yet the big work is now cross-cutting like that. So trying to find a way to kind of uh, endow people with sufficient resources to be able to see that mission through. Um, and then the other thing I think is about your sort of marginal effort. If you think about the daily job jar or the weekly job jar, um, uh, at some point people have their kind of their internal kind of preference. They say, well, the person I mainly work for is X, you know, and the person I, if I've got the capacity I will work for is Y. And um, I think that's a natural human uh, trend and it's sort of reinforced in a way by uh, end of year assessments and things like that. So um, those are the two things to try and solve for, I suppose, incentive you know, structures and uh, um, uh, endowment of resources. Um, Gus's question, where's Gus? Gus, uh, procurement, yeah, so um, uh, risk of stating the obvious, the big challenge is going to be implementing the new Procurement Act, first new bit of government legislation in procurement uh, in 40 years. Um, and there's some really uh, exciting capabilities within that act, particularly in terms of kind of like the, it's much more forward pipeline based, and that is different, people can be a little bit kind of I'll, I'll put out my procurement when I'm ready, and this is much more saying this is what I anticipate needing in three years' time, which is really important for developing the opportunities for the supply chain. Um, there's more scope to uh, adjust the scoring around things like social value and things like that. Um, it's also uh, uh, now pre-solved for the next crisis um, because it's got a, 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 a better mechanism, mechanism for kind of applying an override if you need to in a time of genuine emergency and some defenses against that, basically, the, if you're making direct awards, you have to enhance your tra transparency as a kind of compensating uh, measure. So um, that would be probably the most important thing, thing to focus on. I think something which isn't in the Procurement Act, but is in the nature of procurement now, is that old-fashioned procurement is kind of defining everything so exactly right, and then saying, you know, having a, a competition, who can, who can give us the lowest cost for delivering that exact thing? That is not really the world we're in now. We live in a digital world. We want to be working in a much more agile fashion. So what, you know, where you start and where you finish is going to be very different. So the idea of taking a lot of time to define something really precisely and then holding people to account through contract over a long period of time is kind of um, freezing people into an unchanging world, which seems a poor fit with the reality of a fast changing world where the technology um, curve is still very steeply moving upwards. So that's the, you know, that's not, from the legislation, that's more in the in the market in the context. Um, and Matthew, finally, to your question about um, uh, first of all, you're right. I put great store by by making common cause across the centre um, with within the cabinet office with our many uh, different internal groups, including number ten within that, of course, um, but also absolutely working side by side, joined to the hip with the treasury. Um, made much easier by having such a brilliant colleague to work with as Cat, but that was very much a kind of a strategic issue as well because we saw that in order to achieve lasting change, you needed to make sure the resources were aligned against that. Um, and the Treasury, for their part, were also very conscious they're making decisions about how to give money to people. They needed to do that with a lot of expert professional input. And when we looked, for example, at um, in 21, the SR spending around then. 12 billion pounds worth of bids came in from different parts of government and we stripped out all the ones which were kind of like weak cases or duplications. There were six different digital identity systems bid for. We now have one, one login is very good. One login, important rather, six login. Um, and uh, so that was a big, you know, big efficiency gain, but also um, you know, going, putting all the different bids into a single stack, um, we ended up uh, endowing eight billion of those in a joint effort between Treasury and Cabinet Office. So I think one centre is really, really good. Uh, and also when you're trying to um, work on major programmes, which is a joint effort with the Treasury, again, co-chair of MPRG, IPA, Cabinet Office Treasury Body, Public Sector Fraud Authority, Public Bodies Reform, all those are joint um, Cabinet Office and Treasury. So we've really pushed the one centre agenda, which I think is tremendously important and is that's more important than personality is, you know, Kat's a wonderful person to work with and do a great job taking over from me. But um, the more important thing is that the institutions, if they're, even if they're separate, work in unison. Um, and finally, on your question about evaluation, um, I am madly enthusiastic about evaluation. I think it's one of the most important things you can do in government because um, you don't just sort of hit and hope. 
Uh, what you want to try and do is to set out a case of what you think you'll achieve, do that and see if you have achieved it, and if you don't, start, start over or make improvements to it. And again, because to my previous point, we're in a digital world, we can course correct quickly, we can continuously improve. Uh, we used not to be able to do that in the more analog world. So evaluation is your super tool to be able to do that. Um, and uh, we are now extending that practice right across the whole of the civil service, but obviously we've got further to go there too. Thank you. Great. I think we've got time for one more round of questions. I want to take this, uh, the top ranked question from online from somebody called Liz. Why was it necessary to set an arbitrary figure for return to office rather than empowering departments to determine what works for them and their business needs? Mm -hmm. A couple more from in the room. Um, gentleman back there. Ready? Thank you very much. David Landsman from the D Group. Um, I learned a new word from the Cabinet Office, which I'm very grateful for. It was porosity, yep. interchange between um, civil service, the public sector, and the private sector. How's it going, and what are your aspirations for it? Great. Thanks. And there's a gentleman here at point. John Fitzpatrick, also from the Cabinet Office. Alex, if you had to identify what you're most proud of from your four years in Cabinet Office, what would it be? You can, you can right. see the Miss Fiverr later. Okay. <laughs> um, great question. So, uh, first of all, Liz, um, uh, online. <laughs> so, you're talking about the initiative we took last November uh, to uh, establish a going rate of 60% for uh, office attendance. Um, and you ask, you know, was that a, uh, an arbitrary figure and why can't people decide for themselves? So um, a couple of responses to that. First of all, uh, it wasn't actually an arbitrary figure, it was quite a research figure. So we looked carefully uh, at best practice across um, the wider economy in the UK, other countries, uh, other comparable organisations. That was the most typical level we found. Um, so we were quite modest about that. We didn't think we knew exactly what the answer was. but. Um, that was the most uh, uh, comparable figure. Um, we knew that there had to be a balance because you've got individual people's preferences. Some people like to come in every day, and some people would like to not come in at all. Um, and uh, for good team working, for good collaboration, for good creativity, for good exchange of ideas, and importantly for training and uh, knowledge transfer between people with different levels of experience, we know that office attendance is very important for that. So, Finding a kind of meet you in the middle figure is what we were trying to do. Um, could everyone find their own figure? Well, what we found there was that um, that kind of had been the approach before, and that was causing some problems, partly because um, that gave a sense which individuals could decide for themselves, and some business um, unit heads, team leaders um, felt uh, you know, disempowered by that when the needs of the business were clear they needed people to come in. Um, also, I think the sense of equity and fairness, which um, I would say as an observation, we tend to value especially highly as civil servants. Um, people felt that was unfair that you know, X was having to come in these days and Y wasn't able to. So having a going rate made that uh, easier, especially bearing in mind that because of the uh, regional hubs program we have, you've often got people from different departments working uh, side by side in like areas and people were drawing adverse comparisons between um, uh, department A and Department B in those places. So those are the main reasons which we came across, um, came up with the 60% uh, as something which we debated very carefully across the civil service, all departments committed to that. Um, and so far it seems to be going quite well. Um, we do see that you know, some people would prefer not to come to the office, and some people um, wish everyone's in the office every day. So we won't completely satisfy those people, but by having a a going rate, making good use of our offices, trying to give um, a balance between the kind of the flexibility that people clearly value to be able to work from home some days, and then on other days coming into the office for the needs of the organisation, their wider team. 60% um, seems to an okay balance, and that's not surprising that that is the case because so many other organisations have found that too. Um, so that may not be exactly the answer that you want, and I recognize that oftentimes I get asked that question by people who do not want to come into the office, but um, I won't presume that's your own position, but at least that gives you a sense of why we came up with a single figure across, uh, across the civil service. Um, I should say that uh, that is for people who are office workers, obviously, again, on the equity type issue, if you work in a benefits office, if you work at the border force, if you work in a prison, 
um, your days are not. 60% you come into the, your place of work every day. Um, so um, uh, always very conscious of that as well. Um, David Lansman on uh, porosity, yes. I, I don't think we've invented the word. I think it is actually a word, but I guess it's not a word that comes into everyday conversation. Um, what does it describe? So um, what it describes is basically, um, uh, I think, two or three things. First of all, um, a sense in which the civil service is not, contrary to the caricature sometimes presented in the media, um, uh, an amorphous mass or a, a mandronate or anything like that. It's actually incredibly varied group of individuals and human beings with great skills. Um, and we want to recognize that um, we need to get people coming into the civil service, uh, bringing skills they've acquired elsewhere or knowledge sets, and sometimes just for a period of time. So you might do, in the American expression, a tour of duty. Um, you might go on secondment. I went on secondment for the Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, I came back to the Department of Business 20 years later, so it took me a while, but you know, I did in the end to get back there. Um, quite temporary secondment for um, the OFG. Uh, exactly, indeed, yes. Um, so like, you know, um, that, I think, is, it, it is very healthy to have people moving in and out of government because they learn from their experiences outside, and, um, and government people then you know, learn from their experiences in the wider economy. So that's the porosity concept. Um, and I talked there about business, but that applies to academia, to people working in charities, etc. How's it going? Well, actually, pretty well. This has been quite a quiet success. So um, we were looking at the figures for the top uh, 250 permanent secretaries and directors general. And you might say, well, of all the areas, that must be the hardest thing. You need to kind of understand the craft of working for ministers, parliament, all these other special traditions. 45% um, of those externally recruited, either directly or having come into the SCS and then being promoted from that role. So I think that is a much higher figure than it's ever been in the past, and so speaks, I think, to our improving porosity. Um, uh, I've done my little bit of trying to contribute to that, so obviously working in the business department, CMA, the cabinet office, a lot of specialist functions, lots of people can come uh, into those roles in the private sector, have appointed 12 directors general from outside um, in 11 years. Um, not saying it's a record, there could be, so, but it but, uh, might be, uh, it might stand for a bit. Anyway, so um, I really have tried to encourage that. When I, and that is not because I don't think I have wonderful colleagues in the civil service already. We have most people are internally promoted and they do so in open uh, and uh, merit based competition and do great jobs. But I do recognize that in a fast changing world with incredible challenges we face, we do want to make sure that we're open to the town, to the whole country because the work of government is so difficult and so important that everyone needs to get a chance of working at it, and we need the best of the best. So that's the, the porosity mission, and I think it's working uh, pretty well, but obviously need, need to keep up the effort on that. Can I just ask you, what you because we've done some work on this as well, as you yeah. know, what do you think the biggest remaining barriers are to be able to bring in that talent in the way you'd like? Um, I think you know, uh, job specificity is one thing. Um, so uh, if you look at the work, for example, of people uh, who work on benefits, um, there is an external market in that, uh, and it's called claims assessing, which is the biggest part of the insurance industry. But we see almost nobody you know, moving between those two mm -hmm. things, and that's because we define the work of people working on benefits in such a way that it seems completely different from claims assessing. And if you were working claims assessment, you wouldn't realize that was a job that you could do. Mm -hmm. So trying to make it easier for people to, to, for the jobs to be done by people externally. Um, also, I think that on the other side, we perhaps uh, don't do as much, uh, as good job as we could in uh, formally adding to the skills of people working in the civil service with um, different qualifications at different stages and different accreditation for that. I'm very much in favor of that because that will help people then to go, when they go into the, the, the wider world, to get the benefit from all the things that they've learned from it, as opposed to saying that you're, a, you're a, you know, an X which means nothing in the wider world or you've just got skills which you can talk to but you've got no external evidence of. So those will help with the porosity thing. Um, it's so important also because I think that the concept of a job for life is going to be less and less typical. People are going to work for a few years. Um, in all, this is true right across the economy, not just the civil service, but we will not be immune from that. So porosity will become more important for that reason as well as for the quality um, reasons that I described before. Um, and yes, so most proud of, well, golly, um, so many things, but I think the thing that um, 
is the most important is the response that was made to COVID. And uh, I think, you know, the, uh, within that, the willingness uh, that I saw from colleagues uh, when the rest of, uh, of the country were kind of, well, the whole country was facing you know, a really fearful situation, enormous uncertainty, unprecedented challenges to roll their sleeves up and work um, in a night and day uh, under relentless pressure of month after month to find working solutions and get ourselves out of a hole. And I think we did uh, do that. And I, I think that was the uh, supreme achievement. And I know lots of people were uh, much more involved than I was in that. And you know, anyone working at the front, uh, um, the front line in the NHS, for example, you know, people, um, everyone in the country affected because of the impact on households. But I did, again, want to finish where I started with just paying a, paying a a uh, huge tribute to the civil servants across government who did amazing work in response to that, including colleagues in the Cabinet Office. Thanks very much. Well, I think that's something we can all absolutely endorse. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for. I'd like to invite you all to thank, join me in thanking Alex uh, for joining us today. But can I also say thank you, Alex, to everything you have done for the civil service over your career. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so if we could put our hands together.